But um, not on this. But but so I, I think that there was really a, a, a there was a restraint to this, and uh, and I think that um, um, and, and a complete wildness to it. You know, like that wasn't that wasn't like. You know, I, I didn't go in there and say like, you know, oh, you should do it like this. Uh, as a matter of fact, I was usually not in there. Uh, um, you were you were there for you were there for Maggie's scene. Yeah, and I made the one suggestion. But yeah, that's it. That's I, you know, like, generally, I think that um, you know, I remember when the, the performance artist when she, when she came in, and, and I remember you know, kind of being in the other room, and, and you guys like being like, oh boy, we just left like places or. Like, yeah, and there was part of that scene that didn't make the film where because she's bilingual and, and more French than mm. where we where it became a, like a French. Yeah, I couldn't. Film. I couldn't take the French. We were. Uh, uh. It's just like we, we were. This is not a. This we is not going after each other in a French. This is like <laughs> Nora Ephron meets oh. Paul Mazursky. Yeah. <laughs> this is an uh, 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 It became a hybrid of something not appropriate for the film, but that's where it went. But, um, yeah, but she was like, <laughs> 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 It was just like, <laughs> 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 You remember David Briggs, right? We saw a couple of that. David Briggs is here, dialogue editor. But, but, <laughs> and Anthony, when you were cutting those scenes, um, was there something that you, that you were keeping in your mind around how you wanted them to work? Yeah. Because of Robin, and I had the advantage of being an editor, I have only what's in front of me. And so it really did turn into what's the rhythm at that part of the film that we want to convey. And that really, the, then that with uh, Barbara, uh, uh, Barbara's uh, score really started to, it, it does start to craft itself, depending on what we want everybody to feel. And, 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 you know, more serious note, there's, there's an element of mirroring in every one of those dynamics. Um, and uh, there's something in the, the character that she's excavating through each of those uh, liaisons. And so it's, it's not, they're, they're always psychosexual. They're, they're never, um, uh, you know, isolatedly sort of like a sex scene. They all have a, they all have a Sort of it was function. super empowering, like yeah, watching um, Mimi and watching Kate and watching Daria. Like it was super empowering because you know Robin did not or I did not require anything that anybody didn't want to do. You know what I mean? Like Maggie had a bunch of stuff that she didn't want to do. You know, and, and everybody did. But like Robin made everybody feel so comfortable and empowered. Would you all say that? Yes. yes totally. Yes. And, um, but because they've said it before, I'm, I'm just echoing what they've said. Well, it's you know? a great way to get over any kind of self-consciousness you might have to, and this is in any acting scene, to make the scene about the other person. And, um, and in a way, that's also what the character is doing. And she's trying to make her, mm -hmm. the other person, always feel uh, comfortable, relaxed, open, feminine, whatever it might be. And so if that then is my goal, I don't worry about how I am doing or something. And it became a hooker. It takes it because it became a hooker. Yeah, it takes it takes the it takes the self consciousness out of the scene to have something to do, for sure. Well, I mean, also, I generally, I just wanted, I just wanted to comment on on the fact that that you know there's something to be said about how sexy the film is without it being extremely explicit. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, like it's sort of like uh, I think that's the genius of, of like you know sort of the sexuality of the film. It's like there's so much that's sort of suggested, and there's so much that there, there's really not a lot of, you know, there's there's just not a lot of explicit, like you know, you know, like I don't know, there's just not, you know, um, uh, you know, or whatever it is. It's also the genius of good directing, right? Yeah. Like there's good sexual tension no. and amazing acting. There's good. Did you talk to my mom. <laughs> <laughs> there's good sexual tension that that occurs without you know, needing to see to see all of it. Like, like you, you well, I wanted it to be, I mean, I, one thing that we did talk about is that I wanted it to play like a sexual experience. Like, I wanted, I wanted when she meets, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of like, um, as Robin said, mirroring going on, but also, you know, with the woman number one, she's, you know, actually starting with Kate, you know, she's, I mean, she's like stone, you know, so she's pulling her. You know, she's got that fabulous, Robin's got this fabulous thing where she's like basically Kate's pulling her, Gretchen, you know, and, and Robin's like, 
you know, <laughs> and, and she's pulling her to her, and it's just fantastic. And then when she, by the time she gets to Zaria, she's just has that first kiss, on and on and on and on and on until she kind of turns from this stone-like person who can't really see it to uh, this animal. You know, she sort of accesses that. All right, now we've talked about sex. I want to talk a little bit um, about both um, feminism and also class. Because I think, uh, let's talk about class first. I think it's really interesting in, in this film. Like we are, we're looking at middle, maybe upper middle class lesbians. Um, not a thing that we see very often, in part because we just don't see a whole lot of lesbians um, on TV or on, on screen. Um, and so, when you were when you were conceiving of these characters, were you thinking about the role that class plays in the story and in their lives? Yeah, a lot of people say is this a gay film, and and it's so interesting to me because I sometimes uh, read what people say, and like I'm like, oh, that's really interesting that you think it's so very easy for two lesbians to get to that point. You know what I mean? Like that's really interesting because I don't, you know, that it, that's become so rote. Like oh these white, upper middle class, who gives it, you know, these women, you know? And it's like, well, first of all, that's hard to do. That's not easy to do. So can we just, like, get an amen there? Like, and, like, that would never be seen at, at any point. So that's, uh, that's where I get irate about it, because I'm just sort of like, you know, I remember 20 years ago, my mother asked, asking me, how will you live when I told her I was gay? And now we're here. Like, how, like, how, like, how cynical is that, you know? So I get, I get, like, I, I think that they have a right to be wealthy. I think they have a, if they want to be. I think they have a right to take their kids for granted because they want to be. And I'm kind of getting, you know, I'm sorry I'm up on my soapbox a little bit, but I'm just sort of, like, sometimes I sort of question, you know, that class. Right, because they don't quite, it's not questioned in, um, in heterosexual um, Never in an Adam Sandler movie. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Just when a woman makes one. Where's he at? <laughs> and, and when a woman makes one. Jill Soloway did the same thing, and it was questioned. Mm -hmm. Right, and it only came lesbian. out last weekend. Caught um, me in delight. Um, all right, and so now let's, I, let's talk about feminism a little bit. You, you referenced um, John Dealman and I'm grateful that you didn't put long shots of cutting carrots in the film. Uh, I did. Uh, <laughs> 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 I said, do you want anybody to see this movie? I said, how many people do you want to have watch this movie? <laughs> uh, uh. Will, you, will you talk a little bit about, um, some, some more about what you were thinking about feminism and perhaps third wave feminism when, when you were making this? Um, and... And then I have a question for Rob about this. That's, uh, I'll be very short. Oh, that's such a good question. I've never been asked that before. Uh, I think of this as a third wave feminist film, you know? I had people like Kathleen Hanna in mind when I wrote it. I, I didn't want to judge her. So I just really, I just felt like the judgment needs to stop and let's just go full force into this, you know? Mm -hmm. Let's just not spend a lot of time with that and let's just go into this and see, mm -hmm. see how it plays. And Robin, what is it? Um, what does it mean for? Does it feel like a feminist film to you? <laughs> um, feminism is such a moving target, um, and uh, there's a way in which the word itself has become anti-feminist in a funny kind of way. <laughs> um, so it, it, that's a tricky question because uh, uh, what it is to me is such a human um, story, and. Uh, um, and, it, and it moves me. I mean, I've seen it now a couple times and I, I get distanced from that I did anything in it and I watch the story. Uh, uh, and, it, and it moves me um, because I think this happens to couples uh, almost always at some point in any long-term relationship. And it's put to both of them always, how, how do we, you know, there's the Romeo and Juliet story where things sort of blow up and then there's this story, which is the story of a marriage, where it's like the catastrophic thing happens, and then there's the next day, and the next day, and the next day, and a long parade of days that become a life. And the essential thing in a marriage is, is that the truth 
be known, and then both people have a choice. And that's the predicament that anyone trying to have a long-term relationship finds themselves in. And so it's incredibly universal. And, um, and I think uh, straight men have been very moved by this film, partly because, uh, for once, uh, they are not judged and have a surrogate who's female, so they really can't be judged. Um, for a certain wanderlust that enters in at a certain point mid-marriage where, you know, the, the, old, the old trope would be like, the, you know, the middle-aged man runs off with the secretary and then the cheerful wife accepts him back again, maybe, or maybe she kicks him out of the life or something. And that's sort of the expected midlife crisis story. It's a story of a man who goes through that and, and is the long-suffering wife able to forgive him. But when it's a woman, and when it really is driven by libido, not by some... Uh, wish for acknowledgement and so forth, but just, uh, you know, like, oh, my husband is paying enough attention to me, but to get attention, this is actually driven by libido, which I don't think you see very often. Um, uh, a, a straight male viewer sees a surrogate in this character, and for once gets to look at it as a human situation he finds himself in, and doesn't feel like the bad guy getting beaten with a stick for his impulses. And so, um, it's been interesting to see how it speaks to different demographics. Um, and a really broad spectrum. So that's one thing I, I really respect about the film. Yeah. Anthony, have you? Uh. <laughs> you were just talking about straight men, so I thought maybe I would, um, <laughs> I would segue that's a little bit. That's not a straight man over there. That's why I was hired. I'm a straight guy. <laughs> yes. Have you, have, you, have, you, have you heard that from, from men that you know who have seen the film, or have you? Experience that, not personally necessarily, but that is what drew me to the screenplay and to the project. Is I always felt I related to Abby, and I felt a lot of other people can too, whether you're straight or not. Mm -hmm. Especially as you, you know, I'm getting a little bit older, and. I think all of us can look uh, look behind us and say, "Whoa, where? How did I get here? I was supposed to be, you know, I was supposed to be opening up for Van Halen. I mean, I'm not supposed to be. You know, I got, I have kids, and I'm in, and I'm, you know, yes, I have this successful life, but it's like I'm working at it every day, and this is not exactly what the plan was, and that's what I related to with the project, and so I." And yes, you have the, the, the like the growth and set up like the possibly the I'm gonna get the uh, you know I'm gonna start uh, hooking up with my secretary, and that's not what this is a it, it, it's what the story is, but that's what I got from it is that everybody looks behind them and, and wants to know okay well, where where am I going from here, and that's where I think the film really conveys what is the next step. With this relationship. There's that, there's that line, there's the illusion of choice, which, you know, um, uh, that, that sense that, like, when you're in your 20s and your 30s and you're feeling like you're creating a life and you have all these choices ahead of you and I'm going to make this choice and that choice and suddenly you're in the life that is the result of all the choices that you made and what lies ahead is, is, is your eventual decay <laughs> and death. <laughs> and this is it, you know, and that's... You, yeah. you bring up an important point. Um, a lot of this is, and people talk about collaboration, but, um, you know, the architect of that line is here tonight. Her name is Fonda Duval. And she was uh, on the phone with Robin. We did it real time. And I was stand, sitting there, and I told her, let's, let's do one where we just, we riff. And this brilliant woman who I was always coming up with nuggets, as I've known you for a couple of years now. I, I know your nuggets, but um, I know your nuggets. Um, she just said, it's like, he won't, I mean, it's the illusion of choice. And I'm like, that's what it is. And I just was like, I, I remember just practically crying when she started saying that. It was, it was all of her. And I just, I was like, because she just knew what I was trying to say. And there are these actors sometimes that show you what you write, like Robin, and that day Funda showed me what I wrote. So. Yeah, and we ended up with like that, that, what's really funny about that is that it ended up shifting that line all around that scene, you know, um, because it ended up being sort of a, an anchor in that 
you know, scene and this woman's crying on the other end and like, you know, you have this disembodied voice and like, you know, and it's like, could it get any worse? <laughs> you know, like you're just sitting there weeping at the computer and, and you know, and everything's falling apart and it's the illusion of choice. I don't know, we just shifted that just, around so many places. Such a deadly, I mean, it just like, it just all leads to that. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's just, <laughs> there was a scene with the yard site, the yard site candle in it. In it. That isn't any longer, but this, but this death was a was more of a of a theme or a presence in it. Yeah, there was a lot of death in it before, but like it was like it wasn't sex. It wasn't planned. I'm gonna turn it over to the audience just a minute, but before I do that, I wanted to um, switch from death into to life and talk a little bit about what um, you guys are all working. I'm working on these rainbow loom bracelets. <laughs> my, daughter, my daughter's teaching me rainbow loom. You have a little script. Yeah, I've got a couple of little scripts in the works. So. But nothing to talk about. Okay. You, there's some things. Um, so, tomorrow and the next day are going to be, um, there's this series for Showtime that's having a pilot um, made right now that starts with Stephen Hoffman called Trending Down, and I have a part in that, which I'm excited about. Um, and um, and um, there's a show called Chicago PD that I have about an eight episode arc, and I'm finishing up an, uh, an arc with, uh, with Maggie in um, Sons of Anarchy, so those two things are doing that. Um, and, and, and we're not amorously involved in that. <laughs> so your hopes up. And maybe next season, right? Maybe, um, I don't know if I could compete with Charlie Hunnam, but that's um, but and then um, there's uh, there I just are a confluence of things right now, which is rare in my life. There is a film I just wrapped a couple of days ago, which um, was shot in Nebraska. I, what's nice now because this is so different from the more defining role of the previous chapter of my career, which was Calamity Jane. This is so uh, different that I think I'm finally being understood as a, as a character actor and the, the, the variety of roles have increased. So that's um, been extremely exciting for me. And, and I, I thank these two women tremendously for that I don't think it would have happened without this, uh, this film. So, yeah. 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 Um, I'm not going to follow up on that one. I'm just going to... Uh. <laughs> um, films to come. I guess that's all I'll say. Um, I'll be opening up a taco truck. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. I plan on helping all the ladies on this stage continue in whatever way I can to get their projects off the ground. I have a horror comedy that I'm working on myself. That's really Horror and comedy, yes. Oh, but that's my goal, is just... Keep in the keep in, keep, uh, keep supporting my ladies here. So. Uh, uh. Oh God, it starts with you. <laughs> uh, it's a beautiful film about female sexuality, which is not male. And but my question is that so many times, um, queer filmmakers have a hard time actually filming sex. I'm sitting next to someone who does film yes, sex are. correctly. <laughs> and in this film, you know, that male gaze that would look at all these naked women is avoided somehow. And I'd like you to talk a little bit about how you walk that line um, with your cinematographer. Can you guys hear the question in the back? Yeah. Okay, we're good. Like, Something about male gaze. <laughs> how, the question says about how you avoided the male gaze with your cinematographer. Oh, are we okay? Wow, he's sitting next to Travis Matthews, who is one of my favorites. So. Hi, Travis. Hi. Um, how I avoided that? Um, well, some people might think I didn't, but um, it still made it sexy. Well. Um, I think it kind of goes back to the same question we were talking about when we were talking about sexuality. Yeah. And sort of, and sort of, uh, I, I think, you know, that sort of, 
not being explicit, but like really kind of playing to the emotion of the scene and playing to the the the, the sort of and, and you did such a brilliant job with this, Robin. Like the like the increased like the door is opening. It's like she starts with the first, you know, it starts with you know Daria's character, and it's it's like the the door that's opening is just like you control that so much and in such wonderful stages that I think you know I, I think that there's something about that that's. I don't know. I don't know if it's avoiding the, the male gaze, but I, th I think that it, it's, it's very different than just, you know, slapping two chicks together and saying, go at it. You know, <laughs> giving them a half a bottle of wine and saying, like, get in there and do it. Well, can you just acknowledge this? Like, the, like there's a diversity of, of bodies on screen um, from, like, younger, young, what, 20s to maybe 40s. Um, and older, 50s, 20s to 50s, and there's women with, of, of different shapes and sizes and nobody looks airbrushed, like, the, that's different than, than, the, than the typical thing that we see. Yeah, I also think it, thank you, thank you. I also think it has to do with each of the women. Um, each of those women on screen were incredibly brave, mm -hmm. and I think we, rather than go from a situation of we gotta get going, we gotta get going, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's do, to, we we went from. I mean, each one, I can honestly say, we went from a point of empowerment, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's, yeah, there's so something clear. implicit mm -hmm. in the question that I'm curious about. I mean, it's because I uh, so the you're probably well, the male about gaze, us. You're talking about those of color, right? Mm -hmm. But it's like yeah, but okay. Because I know I don't know if I think that the male gaze always objectified. I mean, so you're talking about subject object, right? Wait, I want that to link this. So well, I think, I think the point of empowerment, the act of empowerment was always present on the screen. And that to me is, for these eyes, is new to see in this kind of film. For those of you in the back, you're saying the act of empowerment is always apparent on the screen. And that repels the male gaze? <laughs> no. The drop the male gaze. <laughs> no, and not, not, the, not, the, not, not the viewer. Wait, he's not asking about the viewer's gaze, not the, not the male viewer's gaze, but the female, the in quotes, male gaze, which is, which is the, a, 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 a stereotypical, um, uh, and, and he asked about the cinematographer, too, in the beginning. So I think it's, it's, look, it's, it's how the lens is looking at the women. Yeah, yeah. And so in, in the most traditional cinema, there's a way that we see the, the lens watching women that's different. Um, I think it's, I think, and to speak to that, I mean, I, I, like, I think, I think what's so, you know, I, it's interesting to have um, uh, been there and produced this film as a filmmaker myself, because I think I, I just, like, learned a lot about, and the word restraint keeps on coming up, because I think, like, you know, my tendency is just to get the lens right in there, you know, shove it in. Like, you know, and, and, I, and there was something that you really great about just, uh, that's right. There was something really great You're about very good at that. Kind, of, kind, of, uh, kind of letting it kind of live back here. Mm -hmm. but a lot of what Stacy set up was like very tableau. Like she was giving the actor the entire space in which to work mm. in. And that's sort of like from a directorial point of view, I think that that's very... But you know, like there was a lot of things that I learned in, in, in terms of that, and, and, and in terms of, of of really trusting you to to like where where else can we go with it, and, and what else can you like going into your creative bag of tricks and all of all of your you know you, you just your amazing skill level, and so for me it was just really uh, um, you know she chose one time to go in close, and that was just literally they are making out, and. There's the, you know, your 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 scene, your your 14 year old boy scene, you know, like you're you're you know like, oops, that happened, um, you know, uh, you know, let me go away now, uh, but you know, like, I, and that's like, and that I think was like a brilliant choice, like to let it to not bring it close in until like you have this moment that's just like, oh my god, she's stripped bare, and all you're seeing is them making out, literally. Like, so, I don't know, there's just some, and it, of course, and I would it's also brilliantly say, active, so it's like... Yeah, it's brilliantly active, and I would also say that um, I would like to just point out the crew. Like, the other thing is, is I think it all has to do also with the amount of respect 
that's sort of on set for the actor. Like Brad Burring, who is the second AC, and the first AC, Justin Hawkins, and David, like literally they'd slate and then they would ever. You know what I mean? They would let the actor work. And he, he was, was 24 years old. Yeah, and he was and an he extraordinary, was, he was extraordinary mature, mature guy. Yeah. guy. And, yeah. and I think that, that bodes well, because that's the new wave of man. Like that bodes well, because that is, none of those guys on my set were like, they were like, let's do this. And yeah, I, they were I, so I, respectful of Robin. I didn't and, mean to get down on the question. I, I more meant to question the assumption, because I, because I, um, I don't, I don't know that that to me feels like the male gaze, you know, one that is uh, objectifying and, and corrupting, or, or, or what have you. I think, I think um, the men I know are, are, are very, are, are curious about women and don't feel that like they understand enough about women and, and, and would like to know in a little more depth, <laughs> you know? Those, those are the, the men in, that, I, that I know, so, um, and I like that the movie uh, helps them see also, I don't think it repels so, that attention. This question here is about the Melissa Rogers. Sorry. And the question is that any of you get in trouble with your personal girlfriends for just giving a little bit of tidbit of their histories on screen? The question is, did anyone get in trouble with their girlfriends for giving um, any of their personal histories on screen? <laughs> did you get in trouble with your girlfriend, Anthony? <laughs> did I? <laughs> no, no, I, I didn't. Female friends, not just someone you date, like your girlfriend's new circle. Female friends. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> No. Oh my friends are whores. <laughs> <laughs> Put it up there. For <laughs> all the world to see. You didn't use literal stories of people you knew, like I used um I did use some literal stories. <laughs> yeah. I I I uh, that one with the freaking cultural the the, there was actually a woman in the store who wanted the guy to put this thing out on the counter. And I'm just like, I mean, Montclair was a big, stark real. But, I mean, like, I didn't know very many people when I moved there. And I just looked at these very hypervigilant housewives and I was just like, God dang it, what did we do? Like, that's part of it. That's part of it. We just, I feel like, you know, we're a generation, Generation X. I kind of lay them on the table a little bit. Like, I, I definitely serve them up. Because I, and it's my generation. I just feel like we're just hook, hook consumers and we're hooked on small indulgences and we don't care about anybody else. And we're so worried about germs. And like, you know, doing this, we're so worried about germs. So yeah, there are a lot of things. And then um, Janelle's uh, part was uh, based on my friend Francesca Castanoli, who is, you know, she's like, put it up there, put it up there. Uh, so I have a lot of good friends who are writers and stuff and they, and they like me using stuff, so. I'm lucky that way. They're they're all like art. Go. You know, you know, and my you know, I mean the question probably on everybody's mind is my wife, you know. She's like, art, go, you know. <laughs> so pretty cool. The question uh, is that Brooke? Yes, hi. <laughs> Uh, no, those films did not inspire this. Um, Can I repeat the question? She's asking about the, um, there's a comparison made, um, uh, a, they called the film a cross between Belle du jour and Stepford Wives, and she's asking what Stacey thinks about that comparison. But you know what, maybe they did, because like, I don't know, I think we've all seen 80,000 movies, and I think also that this film was an experiment, experiment on, that we've all seen 80,000 movies, so let's like, like, let, let's come in in the middle of some of these thoughts, you know, because I don't really need to lay out these thoughts for you, you know, so I think, you know, if Stepford Wives or Girl Most Likely To or those types of films <laughs> played a part in it, it was because it was, you know, in the in the back of my mind, but the things, the, the films that I really drew on were 
I, I love the films of Paul Mazursky. I'm a big Paul Mazursky fan. I like, um, you know, um, Bob and Carol and Ted and Alice. I wanted to evoke some of those character-driven films of, this, of the 70s. And I also wanted to, and I also really, and I was in love with uh, Jean Dillman, Chantal Ackerman, you know, and, and like, and it got like, I got so up my own toughness about it. Like, and I was so lucky to have collaborators that were like, like, you know, cut. <laughs> you know, because those scenes are 25 minutes long if we're like chopping and making bread and making coffee and then there's a hair out of place. And you know, I mean, at one point the, the treadmill scene, God bless you, Robin, that treadmill scene um, was three and a half minutes long. She ran with all that in her mouth. Three and a half minutes. A little inside baseball. Question right here. This is more of a comment. I think that this film succeeded on like every level. You wrote such a beautiful script. Mm -hmm. I feel like every scene earns the next scene, earns the next scene. Mm -hmm. And your performance is just breathtaking. I really, really loved it. Uh, one question I have is the medical scenes a post-concussion where she vomits and then she keeps getting injections. I, I didn't know if I missed something because she asks her, the doctor, are you being safe? Yeah. And can you explain? Um, well, what did you think? Well, I, I, I thought that we were going to find out that she was sick or she was on this odyssey of like having this expression because she was dying or that I, and I was waiting for this moment. But I didn't, well, she's a hypervigilant housewife, so I think she would tell her doctor what she was doing. And I, the shots were hepatitis shots for me, you know. So. Okay. It wasn't like a post concussion, like regime. <coughs> you know, she does ask, you know, how's your head? Right. So um, I think there was, you know, there was a little bit of that. But I, I wanted it to be more along the lines of I see my doctor a lot, and I tell my doctor a lot. Doctor. And you know, there's something about the way Robin. Uh, Robin did the most connective tissue. I mean, I just think of what she did with the connective tissue in this film, and I just, the way she recalibrated every single scene to who this woman was, and the way she just, she, she just, she connected the dots on such a level that she was, we'd have this, you know, I wanted her to be, it's very, it's very hard to describe a character that I wanted to, Robin to be, but Robin is very much this character. And it is this self-possessed, highly intelligent, that sort of doesn't question it, just goes and does it, but knows that she has to have other controls in place. And she says that at one point. I would assume she has some controls in place, because she has controls in place every stop of the of the, of the, you know, so going to the doctor would be one of those controls that you put in place. It's, it's um, I think, to do with, with class again. You know, it's the same way if somebody of that class would travel to India, they'd get, a, they'd get massively inoculated against anything they might catch there. Well, this is her trip to India. <laughs> you know, um, this is her, this is her vacation into another land and where there are diseases wonder. and things and you protect yourself. And so, um, she does it in a very upper middle class way, um, and um, the, it's interesting that, that when we screened this in uh, Berlin, there was much more interest in the issue of class, and here there's much more interest in the issue of sex. <laughs> um, it's American, but um, but there they were very about like like what are you trying to say about the bourgeoisie? You know, and they were, uh, you know, uh, very into that aspect of it. But, but it, it was like, I thought you would love it. I put them on a platter for you. You hate that, right? You know? Well, you realize that in Europe, they, they, they make a dividing line between rich of one type and rich of another type. And it's a very clear line. Whereas here, rich is rich. So when you look at a certain kind of affluence that's starved for art and culture and literature and, and you know, a certain kind of emotional intellectual stimulation, that there's not a clear line between that kind of wealth here and the kind of wealth that is just what they would call nouveau riche, you know, and just and or or, or you know suburban affluence that has become stripped of its petit bourgeois or whatever, it's become stripped of its of its uh, inner life. So that conversation happens there, but it doesn't happen you know, here. But but all those little things that are class indicators um, are laced into the whole film, you know. Um, uh, we have time for one more question, I'm told. Um, here in the 
And more, more along the lines of a, of a metaphor for what a midlife crisis feels like yeah. to me. You know, it's sort of hazy somewhere between sleep and awake, you're aggressive at moments, you're nauseous at moments, you think about death, you you become erratic. And so it just became a metaphor. Do you think, for me, like beginning it felt more like an excuse almost? That this Maybe. Excuses every day. <laughs> <laughs> Just funny. Do you have any parting thoughts for the audience? Like, thanks for coming. <laughs> <laughs> October 4th um, here in New York and uh, in Los Angeles and it grows out from there so please please um, I know you've been sitting here for a long time so I'm hoping that um, you'll tell two Good friends thing. and they'll tell two friends yeah. and so on and so on just to, just to show my age. Tweet it, Instagram it, Facebook, Instagram it. We're very happy that uh, the Radius <laughs> group uh, bought it. They're doing a beautiful job with the materials and y'all be proud. Um, they're putting sex squarely down the middle, which I really appreciate, and uh, we're just very, very lucky to be in their capable hands. So thank you, Radio, for helping us There's so many people here that make this happen, and I wanted to also acknowledge Julie Fame Lawrence, who played Kate. Yeah. 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 And Janelle Loney is here. Yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah. 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 Yeah.